breakfast bars there. Where'd they come? Did you buy them? Huh? Strawberry and blueberry? Why did you buy them? Who are they for? Joan? How about me? Mm. <laughs> we, we've gone on this uh, no cholesterol and fat-free kick, you know. So Entenmann's comes out and they make these uh, fat-free cakes. So there's no fat, but you gain 100 pounds <laughs> just by eating this stuff. So, well, yeah, I have to have ice cream. Welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, this little thing here we're doing. And it's good to have you. You know, the thing we're doing this morning is called Jesus the Strange Encounter. When I was a child and I was raised in, in religious school, went through 12 years in religious school, and my greatest problem with religion and Christianity was the fact that this entity of wisdom called God was unable to figure a better way to solve his problem with this thing called sin than by killing people. I, right from the beginning, the first that I was ever able to understand or think I could understand, I was not able to accept that, was never able to accept. Why is that the only way that you can figure out to forgive somebody is by killing people? And, and you know, and as I grew older, and as I pondered these things, and I always have in my mind pondered these things, I thought to myself, if the Creator cannot figure out a better way than to use violence, maybe that's why all of the people on the earth also cannot figure out a better way than by using violence. So to settle all of the problems of the world, there's violence. But according to religion, I found that that's true because this thing called God also uses violence in order to settle his problem. He tortures to death a young man in order to settle the problem of sin. He then is planning uh, an Armageddon nuclear attack in order to settle the problem of the world. So that to me, here I'm asked then by religion to love God. And then I found myself in a position where not only I couldn't love him, I couldn't even like him. I really didn't like the guy. Because I figured, you know, he's a, isn't there a way you could sit down and talk to people? We were sitting in a Japanese restaurant the other night. And there's a little girl. She was a cute little thing, and she was waiting on us. And I said to her, what is your name? She said, my name, me. And then she looked at Joe and said, she, she. Him, he. And uh, I said, well, OK, you know, this is nice. <laughs> we had miso soup and tempura and teriyaki and all of this stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, how come it was we're eating all of this stuff and bowing to one another, and everybody's laughing in here, and we go home, and we have a Mitsubishi television set, which is burned out. So while we're waiting to get that fixed, <laughs> we have another TV to replace it, which is a Sony. <laughs> How come wasn't too long ago everybody was getting killed, dropping bombs on one another, and now why is, what's, what happened? How come we couldn't watch, you know, and, and be nice to each other then, yet we got to kill each other? And it goes on and on and on. And, you know, there's no answer to it, you know? You drive a Volkswagen, and a few years ago Hitler was so. There seems to be the fact that something has set a precedent that the only way to solve problems is violence. You know, if, if there's too many deer, all the deer are hungry. Well, what do we say? Let's all bring them food. No, let's shoot them. <laughs> let's extend the hunting season. We'll kill them all. That way we won't have so many. And that's always the way. But you see, if the God that you follow has a principle that the best way to solve problems is by killing people, then what are you going to do? And it's exactly what we do. So I searched this, and, and I found, and I, t and I told this God. I, I, I told him many times privately, and I've said publicly, if this is true, and you really killed this guy, and you're going to kill everybody, and you've done all of this warring, not only do I don't love you, I don't like you, and I really don't want to be involved with you. And it puts me in a very precarious position. Because if it's really God, and he's like that, I've had it. <laughs> really. You know, because who else are you going to find? You know, where's another God somewhere? You can say, well, you know, you're a nice, 
you're nicer, but this one here is nasty. <laughs> so then I, 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 I've searched all of my life, and I finally have found what I've tried to share with you, the answers that all of those things that you've heard about God killing people and the violence are not true. That's the greatest thing I can stand here and tell you. It is not so. Never happened. Never will happen. There is no supreme intelligence in the universe who can only kill people in order to settle his ego and to settle problems. One of the things that touched me was the fact of the Bible itself. And, and I don't know how many of you are aware that the Bible you have in your hand is only a fragment of the books that were written. I mean, it's, there's, what do you have, 60 in the Bible? There are thousands of books written. And only those books which equated with the doctrine of the church during the Middle Ages and the early times was allowed to be put into that which you call the Bible. There are many books which are not allowed. And the one, there's two, the Gospel of, uh, of Thomas, who was a disciple of Jesus, and the Acts of John. Written by John, the one that Jesus loved the most, and Thomas, who said, unless I see and feel, you know, I won't believe. And so, you know, when you begin to explore things other than what the church has allowed you to hear, you start to find different stories. In other words, the society that you live in, the culture, the traditions that you've lived in have been deprived of hearing other stories that are not talking about a God who kills and, and fire and all of this kind of stuff. And yet, many of us do not know that these exist. If you can't find the Gospel of Thomas or the Acts of John, let me recommend to you this little paperback book you can find in any bookstore called Occidental Mythology. And that's Occidental spelled O-C-C-I-D-E-N-T-A-L. Occidental Mythology is written by Joseph Campbell. And it contains these uh, epics that I'm talking about because some of you may want to spend a little time in going into these things. You know, this is really, really amazing. But there is an ancient text written by John and Thomas. And the following story that I wanted you to look at with me is really astonishing. Yet it's written by the same John that, according to the Bible, Jesus loved the best. And yet the amazing thing is many of you have gone to church all of your life. And you've, and you've read Bibles, and you know, you've sung songs, you've sung Amazing Grace, and Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and you've done all of these things, yet amazingly you don't have any idea that these things exist. You only know what John wrote, what's in that book. You didn't know that he wrote something else. You only know what Thomas said is in that book. You didn't know that Thomas said something else. You had no idea. See? But yet I'm about to, to tell you something that's very strange to your ears and, and places, uh, places God in a different light altogether. When I think that that's very exciting. Here, here's a story that Jesus comes from the desert and you have in a boat John and James. James is Jesus' brother. And then if you have John, who wrote the Revelation and who was the one that Jesus loved the most, and you hear this voice from the shore, and he, he yells out to these guys in the boat, come on in here, I, I, I have need of you, I want to I talk to you, come on in here. And James looks out, and he says, John, who, what's that, who's that little kid? And John says, what do you mean a little kid? There's an old guy there, the old guy, the guy with the beard. He says, what do you expect of you? You went out in the boat too long. He says, a little kid. He said, well, I don't see any little kid. He said, I see an old guy. He said, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. He's yelling something. But he said, let's go in and find out. So they go in to the shore, and this Jesus helps them land the boat. And John says in the Acts of John, the guy was bald, but he had a thick beard. And James said he was very young. And he had thick hair, and the beard was just starting to come in. Did you hear? Here, here, here's one said, he's a little kid. No, he's an old man. The other said, the guy's bald, but he's got a thick beard. The other guy says, the beard's just starting to come in. But boys, he got a head of hair. 
You know what's being said here? This God, this Jesus, does not look the same and is not the same to all people. It depends on you. It depends totally on your perception. It doesn't mean that you can think of him as the Catholics think of him, or as the Baptists think of him, or as the Methodists think of him. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to think of him as Christian. You see him totally different. You may see him as a big fat. You may see him as a wisp of smoke. You may see him as a butterfly. You may see him as an eagle. You may see him as a, as a gust of wind. You may see him in all different ways, but no two people will see him or understand him the same way. Huh? That's what's being said. Oh, he's an old man. Oh, he's a little kid. He's got a lot of hair. He's bald. He's got a beard. Now it's just starting to come in. How come he's standing right there, but they see him totally different? And, and basically, the problem with our lives and our religions is you've all come into church and you all stand up and you hear about the Jesus and you all said that you have to see him this way. Which way? The way the group says you must see him. Even though you say, gee, I can't, I can't conceive of this. You're supposed to love him. How do I love him? I don't even know who he is. And John says, I watched him closely. I never saw him blink. And sometimes when he would hug me, his chest felt soft. Other times it was hard as stone. Sometimes when, when you have a relationship, even in meditation, you can slide right into nirvana and you can fly with the wings of an eagle. Other times you sit here and your mind is just distraught and your mind blanks you and just bangs away at you and won't let you enter into the thing. It doesn't make any It all depends on you. And then John says, and when we walk together, I look to see his footprints on the earth. You remember when you said there was two sets of footprints and then there was one set of footprints? You know what John says? When he walked with me, I looked to see his footprints on the earth, and I never saw it. How could you walk on the earth and not leave a footprint? Because you're walking through the mind. The footprints are walking through the caverns of the mind that have nothing to do with the earth. And all of these things that you have propelled yourself to believe all of your life have nothing to do with physical reality. I could hide behind a tree when I say that Jesus was not crucified. But you know, I won't. I come out and I say, I have great exciting news to give you. The heavenly father, the heavenly mother, kill and torture nobody. They make right, they heal, they bring things up, they make things good, they make things grow, they caress, they take care of them. One of the exciting things that we have going on in our house now, we have new babies. There's a, there's a um, birdhouse. Who did you, who Judy? Mike and Judy made a birdhouse. And for three years, not one bird went in the birdhouse. I was blaming it on Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody dar no birds darken Judy's door. But guess what? There are babies in your, in your house. They're sticking their little, we have binoculars and we can see, and they stick their little mouths and they, op they all got their mouths open, just like Judy. Whoa, <laughs> Stand up so they can see. Can you see? That's true. And, 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 and we're all excited. See, this, this is God. To me, when I look at that, that's God. I don't want to hear about somebody nailed to blood and guts and bombing people and killing people and going to do all of these things. The little birds are born. That, that's nature. That's life. And this is a beautiful thing that I think of when I consider what God is. So the appearance of Christ was a function of the mind. And that's what Christ is. That's what Jesus is, a function of the mind. And how do you see him? How do you see him? What is it to you? And it doesn't mean that because you don't see him the way she does or vice versa, that it's not the same. It's the same. It's, see, some people in this world call Jesus Buddha. Some people in this world call Jesus Krishna. Some people in this world call Jesus Muhammad. See? Some people call all kinds of different things. And, and the other people get mad and all ticked off. Oh, you can't call him that. You have to go by... And the ones that call Jesus, Jesus don't even know that Jesus isn't his name. Never was. 
All the prayers have to end in G. Do you ever see them on television? And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Who the heck is this? His name is Jehoshua. So what do they have to say? He's walking down the street. Hey, Jesus. He's not going to turn around. It's not his name. So if you really want to use a, a, a proper name, then why not use the right name? Don't you see why everything's screwed up? They're using somebody else's name. <laughs> this Jesus that they're using, he could be a fakakta. I'm praying this in Jesus' name, and there's God up there. Oh, geez, there's this guy again. Who's this Jesus guy? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody made it. Where did they make it up? Where did it come from? They made it up. They don't have any trouble using Saddam Hussein's real name or Ayatollah Khomeini's real name. They couldn't use Jesus. They couldn't say Jehoshua because that blows the whole deal. Even to this day, they know his name was not Jesus. There's never been a Jesus that ever lived in that part of the world. They live in Puerto Rico and Cuba. You'll never find a Jesus living in that part of the world. And they'll still, they'll say, in Jesus' name, and his name is Jehoshua. It's a form of Joshua. So why not say it? If you want to pray in the proper name, they say, we ask this in Jehoshua's name. They couldn't say that because their tradition wouldn't allow them to say it. I wouldn't say it either. Because, you know, it's a traditional thing. We say, hey, in Jesus' name, we still do it. But that wasn't his name. So that's the big joke. So when everybody gets to heaven, they'll say, you got to let me in every prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. But then the guy said, well, that's the problem. He doesn't live here. <laughs> we don't have anybody here by that name. Boy, am I screwed up. <laughs> but you know, there's an interesting thing. The first centuries after the birth of Jesus, if you will, the appearance of Buddha was interpreted exactly the same way. Always fat, always skinny, always bald, always got hair. That same thing. Because the point is, every human being has their personal encounter with this thing called God. To, you're totally unique, and it doesn't make any difference. You come to church, and you say you're a Methodist because your traditions say you're a Methodist. Your mother was a Methodist. Your father was a Methodist, so you're a Methodist. Your mother was a Catholic, your father, so you're a Catholic. And you go in because of your traditions. But inside of yourself, you see this encounter, whatever it may be, totally unique. And you know what? You'll never tell anybody. You'll never tell anybody how you really feel because you'll get everybody ticked off. I let if my parents ever knew what I was thinking of when they were packing me off with my little my little catechism and my white suit to go to Holy Communion, and I was my head was freaking out when I was a little kid. They'd open the box and they're taking God out of the box, and I'm sitting to myself like, yeah, "This is crazy. This is crazy." People got handkerchiefs on their head, and I'm sitting in there. What the heck am I doing here? And I'd go to confession. I'd have to ask everybody, "What the heck am I supposed to say?" What are you going to say? Oh, I say I did three bad words. I'll say four bad <laughs> The only time in my life I was completely guiltless. I was seven years old. I'm going in making up sins. <laughs> I'm making up stuff to say I'm guilty. I didn't, what did I do? <laughs> I'm guilty. For what? I said four bad words. The only time, pure as the driven so they couldn't, you see, what happened, really, the guy that was sitting in that box should have come on his knees to me and told me what the hell he was doing. <laughs> so God becomes what we perceive God is behind the mask of individual identity. And that's something you want to hold on to and understand. God, Jesus, are individual identities that grow and develop with inside of you, completely different from the way that anybody else thinks. And so sometimes it's interesting for you to, to sit down and share. Maybe we could do it sometime. What is Jesus, what is Jesus like? Because I don't know. I only know what Jesus is like in here. I don't know what Jesus is like in Judy or in Corinda or whomever. What, what is Jesus like? It's an individual thing. Wow. I see God this way. You see God that way. You know? The amazing point is that Jesus Christ said, I will come back and I will be found inside of you. At that time, you will know I am in the Father, you and me and I in you. Let me show you a very interesting thing that, sh that points this out. This is all mythology, so understand that. Go to page 862 in the Little Bibles, 862, and we're in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. 
And here's the point where, according to the biblical story, Jesus is crucified, he resurrects, and two of his disciples are walking down the street. Look at uh, uh, Luke 24, uh, verse 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together, these are the two guys walking down the street, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But look at verse 16. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Huh? Say, interesting. In other words, he is right in their midst. He is right in the middle of them. They can't recognize him. That's what's going on today. The Christ of Aquarius is right in the midst of the world, but they don't see it. The resurrection has taken place. The resurrection that is within you is the movement from the lower flesh into the higher realms of consciousness, but those who should see it don't see it. Now, let me show you something interesting. Look down to verse 29. As they're walking along, say, uh, Verse 28, they drew close to the village and, 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 they, and he made as if he was go further. In other words, this is saying to you that you are the one that has to deliberately open the door and bring that Christ consciousness to actively participate inside of your head. See, because he says it, he made like he would go on, but they constrained him, abide with us for this evening, and he went in to tarry with us. Now, this is the interesting part. Here is when the Christ is inside of you, actively inside of you, then you have communion. That is where you consume that which is the bread, the truth, that which is the wine, which is the spirit. And look what happens, verse 29, at, at verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat, in other words, he sat down, you're eating, you're consuming, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, and look at verse 31, and their eyes were open, and they knew him. Huh? See, right in the midst, they can't tell. What do you have to do? You have to take him inside of your house, and your house is your mind. And you take him inside of your house, which is your mind, and there the communion of, 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 of digesting the bread, which is the truth, and this wine, which is the spirit, takes place, and your eyes, your inner eye, the single eye is open, and you recognize this is him. This is what they've been talking about. This is what they've been preaching about. Now I experience, I understand, now I know. You'll never be able to tell anybody. But I know. In the Greek Egyptian, it's called Hermes Thought, H-E-R-M-E-S-T-H-O-T. It says, if then you do not make yourself, listen to this very carefully, this is Egyptian, okay? And I want you to understand this. What is God's name? I am. We were talking about this a moment ago. God's name is I am. If I say to you, who is the President of the United States? Bill Clinton. Who is God? I am. Very difficult for religionists to deal with. But this is the plan. This is the master plan. God is I am. I am God. Okay? It is not that Bill Donahue is because as Jesus said of my own self, I'm nothing. But when I rid of the self, and I rise into the higher realms of nirvana, all that is left is God, and then I am God. When I am in that point of meditation, and I am totally out of myself and into that which is the universe inside, then I am God, okay? Watch what, 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 what I'm talking about here. This is Egyptian from the Greek Egyptian Hermes thought. It says, if you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot comprehend God, for like is known by God like. If you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot comprehend God, for like is known by like. Find your home in the haunts of every living creature. Make yourself higher than all heights. Think you are in the womb, you are young, you are old, you have died, you are alive, you are in the world beyond, for you are everywhere. And if you cling to the body and say, I know nothing, I am afraid, then what have you to do with God? Huh? That's interesting. That's Egyptian, ancient Egyptian. If you cling to the body, in other words, if you cling to the lower self and say, I don't know anything, I've got to go to church, I've got to have, then he says, what have you to do with God? In the Acts of John, and this is probably the most beautiful thing that you'll ever read, but I want you to remember this is written by John of the Revelation. This is written by John, who, who, who was the one that Jesus loved the most. And in the Acts of John, John narrates the Last Supper. 
And he said when they come out of the Last Supper, they did a circle dance. And Jesus stood in the center of the circle. And the 12 danced around him. And they would sing out. And Jesus would say, Hallelujah. And they would sing out in this dance. And what it is is a description of the movement of the 12 signs of the zodiac around the center sun. The movement of the 12 around the Christ, the movement. Don't you see? As the 12 disciples are dancing around the sun, who is the light of the world, the 12 aspects of the zodiac are dancing around that which is the sun, the light of the world, in the very same way. <laughs> Look, when you start thinking about a God who murders people in order to forgive you, don't forget something very important. On December the 21st, the sun in the sky comes down through a constellation which is called the cross. The sun is crucified on a constellation called the cross on December the 21st. On December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, that sun is entombed in the bowels of the earth. It's called the winter solstice. Crucified three days and three nights in the tomb. The resurrection of the new birth of the Son of God occurs on December the 25th. Do you know how I knew that God didn't slaughter anybody or didn't kill anybody? Do you know the ancient story of Mithra, which predates Jesus by thousands of years? Mithra is killed December the 21st, resurrects and is reborn on December the 25th. The birthday of Mithra is December the 25th. And so I said, gee, wait a minute. I'm looking at a cosmic thing here. I'm looking at a, I'm not look. I mean, what, what, per, don't you think, what, I mean, be reasonable. I mean, for, for once in our lives, let's be real. What purpose would it be for some God that nobody even knows who he is, where he is, or what it is, going to kill some guy and say, that pays for everything? For what? What? You go into Atlantic City, you had a cigarette, you, you read Playboy, this necessary to kill people over this? What is this all about? And here, then, you understand that the sun... See, why does this happen? Do, why does the sun have to go through there? Can it go uh, make a U-turn and go around here? No, it can't. It's got to go. The law of life says it's got to. So the sun travels through the cross into the tomb of the winter solstice, is born December the 25th for a purpose. 30 days after it is born, something happens. 30 years after he's born, something happens. 30 years after he's born, Jesus goes into the water and is baptized by John. 30 days after it's born, the sun goes into Aquarius, the water man. Huh? What do you think this is? What is don't you see what this is? And then why all of this? So he's killed, resurrects, he's born, he's baptized. For what? Because in the spring, he intercedes with the Lamb of God that takes away the cold of the winter, Aries. The burnt offering takes place. The sun consumes the lamb. For what? So then the sun can sit at the right hand of the Father. In the northern hemisphere of the eastern sky, the sun sits. So what? Because spring comes. Everything which was dormant in the winter of the soul starts to birth forth in new flowers, new babies. Everything becomes all brand new. But unless the sun goes through the cross, unless the sun is in the tomb, unless the sun is born, unless the sun is baptized, unless the burnt offering takes place, unless the sun makes its trajectory every year, you can't have spring and you can't have summer. You can't have new life. You can't have flowers. You can't have all the beauty that comes. And so I say, well, <laughs> all right, hey, you got me, so what's that got to do with me? Because the sun, point to your, some are fat, some are not so fat, but right in there, you know what's in there? Solar plexus, the place of the sun. And when the sun is crucified in the, on that beautiful cross of light in meditation, then it sits in that tomb when new life is born through the meditation. It is reborn and it rises upward and impacts what is the uh, comp uh, part of complementary part of the of the Aries, which is the pineal gland of the brain. It opens the right hemisphere of the brain and summer comes to your life. That's what this is all about. It doesn't require God to slaughter people, kill people, drop bombs on people. It requires you to follow and let the Jesus part of you be crucified, sit in the tomb of meditation, be reborn and rise up into the pineal gland of the brain so that you can have new life. That's, that's a beautiful thing. 
and it takes away all of the blood and guts and torture and all of this horror of, of, of this thing that and you're Armageddon. You want Armageddon? You need it? Certainly you want Armageddon. What is Armageddon? Armageddon is the fire that comes down from heaven to destroy the earth. The earth is the lower mind. The fire is the spirit. And when you submit yourself to this, you'll have an Armageddon. The spirit will come down from the higher realms of consciousness and burn up all of the things which have been torturing you and hurting you and killing you all of your life, and it will set you free. And you will be refined as gold. That's what the Bible says. So here, then, this, 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 this dance takes place, and as the twelve dance around, see, just this sun, see this sun that must be crucified, don't forget, all of its time dancing around the sun are the twelve constellations of the zodiac. We'll do one tonight, Leo. But they all dance. But yet, even though that this, this, the, the constellations dance around the sun, the sun must still go through the cross. Do you know that even now, we've passed the summer solstice of the, the longest day of the year, June 21st. And even now, every day is getting a little shorter, a little darker. The sun is starting to go down. And why? Because as the sun is starting to lose, it has a rendezvous with the cross. Again, December the 21st, it will again rendezvous with the cross. And on December the 25th, when you're all given your presents and everybody's singing jingle bells, is the real day that the sun is born. God's light of the world is born on December the 25th. So the dance around the sun is fine for the constellations of the zodiac, but still it must meet its rendezvous with the cross. And there's a reason. As it is without the macrocosm, so it is within the microcosm. You have a rendezvous with the cross. It's not a physical cross, but this is a cross of light. Let me, let me show you this. John says, My beloved, having danced with us, the Lord went forth, and we fled this way and that. And then John says something. I saw him suffering. And when he was hung upon that cross, darkness fell at the sixth hour. The, sixth, the number six means that which is the works of the lower flesh, among other things. That's why when Jesus was uh, the water man at Cana, remember, they brought him six jars of water. And they represent the six ages which have gone before this age of Aquarius. They're empty. There's nothing left of them. There's nothing left to be experienced anymore. It's all been done, all of the inventions and all of the new things. And now you enter into the seventh, which is Aquarius, which is an age of consciousness, and your mind is changing, and the minds of people all over the universe is changing. The universe itself is changing. The thought patterns are changing as we move into this new time. But see, there's, there's an interesting thing. The number six is the number of works, that is the lower flesh. The number of nine is the number of consciousness of the mind. I've done this for you before, but remember, a 666, six, six, which is the sign of the beast, this is the way it works. You add 666, six, six, you get 18. 1 plus 8 equals 9. The beast is the lower mind. 144,000 are saved. 1 plus 4 plus 4 equals 9. That's the higher mind. When Jesus says in John 21, cast your net to the right side and you'll catch fish, they catch 153 fish. 1 plus 5 plus 3 equals 9. Okay? So here, when the sun is... See, do you understand what this is? This is not a real man getting killed. This is the sun being destroyed. This is the sun being... It's the sun. It's the energy within you being destroyed. When you destroy that lower energy, you give life then to the higher energy. Look, there is darkness at the sixth hour. What is this all about? What? Go with me just for a minute to page 806. Let me show you something interesting. Page 806, Matthew chapter 27. Page 806. Okay? Matthew chapter 27, page 806. Look at what it says on verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land unto the... Ninth. What? Ninth hour. Right? All of that which of the lower flesh is destroyed, and now the light returns to the aspect of new consciousness at the ninth hour. And what have you just seen? When the sun is crucified, what happens? There's an eclipse. There's an eclipse. Real people, when real people get killed, not, this, is an, this is the death of the sun. But the lower sun of the solar plexus must be killed so it can rise to become the higher sun. The Jesus in you which is in the solar plexus must be killed so it can rise to be the Christ in you that is in the higher mind. But then this is the important part that I wanted to show you. He says, I fled. Well, John is looking at this guy on the cross, bleeding and naked and 
spears, spears in him and thorns up. Check out all that mess. And John runs up into this cave and he says, I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, it's like I, I'm loving, and this guy is bleeding to death, and these people, and he says, I couldn't handle it anymore, and I ran up this pathway. I knew where this cave was where I could just sit by myself and freak out and get out of there, and I walked into the cave, and there standing there was Jesus, and he was laughing. <laughs> He's laughing, this guy. Huh? He's got a sports shirt on, a pair of moccasins. <laughs> got his t-shirt on says Jimmy Buffett lives <laughs> and he's laughing it is great he's not on the cross he's not bleeding it's not guts all over the place God didn't do it he's in a cave and he's laughing look at turn to page 463 for just a minute look at the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 2, you there? Look at verse 4, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. And so John says, and, and as he stands there, after coming from this horror spectacle, John says, I, now remember what I'm telling you wasn't written by a new age somewhere. This is written by John, who wrote the book of Revelation. This is written by John, who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's just a book that the church would not allow to be put in, because then you have to think, maybe this God is not the ogre. Maybe I don't have to be scared to death of this God. Maybe there is a plan that makes sense, and it's a loving, kind plan. And so Jesus speaks to John in this cave, and Jesus says, John, for the multitude below, I am crucified pierced with lances, given vinegar and gall to drink, but to you I speak, and to what I speak, give ear. In other words, listen to what I'm telling you, because secretly I have caused you to ascend this mountain. And those of you who come in here on Tuesday nights and sit and raise that energy up from the lower up into the higher are caused secretly by that same Christ to ascend that mountain to listen to truth. And he says, secretly I caused you to ascend that mountain so that you should learn what a disciple must learn. Are you ready? You sit here looking at me and you listen to me. Are you ready? Now you have this privilege of entering into the same cave, entering into the same aspect of meditation that John entered. And Jesus speaks so that you can learn what a disciple must learn. And John says, and he showed me a cross of light. And upon the cross of light, I saw the Lord, but he had no form. And Jesus said, John, this cross is the uplifting of things, the harmony of wisdom, the cross spiritually bound all together, which causes all things to rise up. And then he says, it is not the cross that you will see when you go down there. This is what Jesus said. Huh? He said, the multitudes see that because they're looking with these eyes. But you see a cross of light because you're looking with a single eye. This is the difference. If you're going to look with the, see, with, with, with the eyes of the church and the eyes of religion, you're going to see a God who slaughters people and tortures people to death and who cannot figure a better way out to handle the salvation of the universe than by torture and death. But if you look with a single eye within yourself, you see a cross of light that lifts you and stretches you outward and allows you to embrace the beautiful mother of the heaven, the beautiful queen of heaven, the beautiful life of heaven, and you become one in the nirvana bliss of that which is nature and truly God. See? And this is what he says. This is what he says. He says, I was thought to be what I am not. And now listen to what Jesus said to John about the crucifixion. Do you remember the, remember the, remember the guy in the, in the church that wrote, he says, oh, don't draw a picture of a unicorn. Let them draw a picture of the crucifixion. Listen to what Jesus Christ said to John in this Acts of John, he said, John, what they say of me is wretched and unworthy. What they say of me is wretched and unworthy. Those who neither see nor name the place of stillness will ever see the Lord. 
Go over that again. Listen to me just for a minute. We're almost done. But listen to what Jesus just said. Those who neither see nor name the place of stillness will ever see the Lord. It's the place of stillness within you. Right. The whole, that's right, Pat. Stand still. That's what, that's what Exodus 14, 14, Moses says, the Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. And then Jesus said, in brief, John, what they say of me that I have suffered, I have not suffered. But what they do not say, that I have suffered. In other words, that which God suffers, that which Christ suffers, is the turning of the back of people on the truth and, and, and making God out to be a murderer. You can't, you, can't equi- you can't get away with this any other way. When, when, when God turns around and, and kills Jesus according to them, that's murder. And the reason it's murder is he's using people that have no idea what they're doing to do it. He uses a Judas who didn't know what he was doing. He uses a Pontius Pilate who didn't know what he was doing. He uses soldiers who didn't know what he's doing. And I know he did because Jesus Christ said, forgive them because they know not what they do. It's murder. It's a, you know what it is? They call it 1992. They call it getting a contract out of somebody. And you're killing people and you don't even know why you're killing them. But that's not what happened. And this is what Je- Jesus says. First, know the word. And you know what Jesus called the word? The inwardness, the meaning. Then you will know the Lord. And thirdly, I will, you will know the man and what he has suffered. And John said, when he had spoken to me, He was caught up. And when I went down, when John went down, this is John talking of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John says, I came out of the cave. I looked down at all of the people wailing at the cross, and I laughed at them. I laughed at them. I laughed at them. For he had told me that what they had said concerning him, and I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. And this is what John said. Now listen very carefully. Holding fast this one thing in myself, that the Lord carried out everything symbolically for the conversion and salvation of all. Here's Peter. Holding fast that the Lord carried out everything symbolically for the conversion and salvation of all. That is in the Acts of John written by John, who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the Lord carried out everything symbolically for the conversion and salvation. Don't you see? Religion doesn't see the cross of light. You and I have never seen the cross of light. We've spent all of our lives looking at our... On a hill far away stands an old rugged cross that they kill people on. What would they do if this was 1993? In a room far away it's an old electric chair. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's a means of execution. But see, they see the wooden cross. They see the blood. They see the spear. They see the violence. But there, they, when they look with earthly eyes, that's when you see. But this is the point that you do. You come and you lift yourself up that pathway. You enter into the cave of meditation. And when you enter into the cave of meditation, you see the cross of light. You meet that which is the Christ of light. And you begin to understand, as John did, that this is a symbolic crucifixion of the Jesus who resides in the lower to be lifted up into that which is the Christ of the higher. The cross is a symbol. When you come out of that cave of meditation, that's when you know the truth. And then we know, as John knew, that what is taught of blood and killing. And what did Jesus Christ say? And the next time that you're walking down the street, and the next time you turn the television on, and they start talking about the killing and the bloodletting of God, then you understand that Jesus Christ said, what they say is wretched and unworthy of me. Yes. What they say is wretched and unworthy. Could you think of anything more wretched and unworthy than to say the one who creates puppies and whales and dolphins and the Alps kills and murders people to find a way to forgive? Or could you say that the one who has created the rose has created a way that you can rise within and crucify the lower, rise up into the Christ consciousness and overcome yourself? That's beautiful. We have been deceived. This whole world has been deceived. And the same people that do the deception are 
filled with nothing but violence and have waged war upon war upon war and dropped bomb upon bomb and little children even to this day in Bosnia and elderly people and people of all ages are being slaughtered and killed and hurt in playgrounds and hospitals because the Serbs of the Muslims and, and the Christians hate each other's guts. In the name of God, they kill each other. Now you can say, but, but you see, you got your Bible here. Look at your Bible. And you got your, look at your Bible. And you could say to me, well, now wait a minute here. I know about the crucifixion. I know the crucifixion occurred. And the crucifixion occurred on Golgotha, on a hill far away, in Calvary. They led him outside of Calvary. And they crucified him in Calvary outside of Jerusalem. I know that this happened. Because it says so. Come on with me. This is the last thing we're going to look at. I'm going to shut up right after. Go to page 1008. There's something I want to show you. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Hurry up. Hurry up, time's running out. Revelation chapter 11. I want to show this to you. It's important that we see it together. Because was it a hill far away? Was it on Calvary? Was it in Golgotha? That's what you've been told all of your life. The Bible's got something to say. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 11, page 1008, verse 8. Let's read it together. You with me? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. What's that all about? Huh? Anybody ever show you that? Oh, I never saw that. <laughs> You're not supposed to see it, and if you do see it and you ask them, what's that all about, they'll say, You're not supposed to question. You don't question. You do question. And you ask and you say, what the heck is this all about? And what it's all about is this is a spiritual crucifixion that we all take place in. And what you've got to do is take your eyes off the physical cross, go up the mountain of meditation into the cave and see the cross of light and meet the Christ who will then take you into his arms and lift you up into the realm of nature and light to be one with God. Thank you very much.